Um, so I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners as the original custodians of the land that we're all meeting from. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to those who are joining us to view this session today. We come together today to celebrate and pay respect to the cultural significance of Indigenous visual art, cultural materials, customs and traditions, and acknowledge the rich ongoing contribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art in Australia. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this demonstration with artist Cassie Latham. Cassie is a Tanarung Wurundjeri woman from the Kulin Nation, an artist, master weaver and educator. Cassie is extremely passionate about sharing her Aboriginal culture, including traditional medicine, food and artifact making. Cassie is renowned for her specialist knowledge of native plants and bush tucker and for reviving traditional skills through her art. Cassie is an active member of the Indigenous community and has taught her culture, art and bush tucker for many years. This event is part of NAIDOC Week celebrations held by the city of Burundara to honour the history, culture and achievements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The theme of this year's NAIDOC Week is Always Was, Always Will Be. This theme recognises that First Nations people have occupied and cared for this continent for over 65,000 years. For the next hour, Cassie will give insight into her culture and connection to country, which is integral to her art making practice. We'll learn of Cassie's passion for the weaving techniques she uses and the natural materials that she forages from her local surrounds in Boysdale, where she lives on Gunai Kunai country. Earlier this year, the Town Hall Gallery acquired four of Cassie's incredible works of art, which is such a privilege for us, including midden pots and two healing mats, both handcrafted from native grass and detailed with emu feathers. The grass and emu feathers were smoked in ceremony and weaved to traditional song. Cassie's work is held in the National Gallery of Victoria collection, and she has been acknowledged through several art prizes, including the Curry Art Prize at Curry Heritage Trust, Victorian Indigenous Art Awards, and the Telstra Art Awards. Cassie, I'm so excited about today's session and want to thank you so much. And also thanks to the many guests who have joined us today to learn about Cassie's culture and art making. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the session, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen throughout the session, and I'll read them aloud at the end to Cassie. Um, and just so everyone is aware, we are recording this session. Uh, so I'll hand over to you, Cassie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rachel. What a beautiful introduction and acknowledgement to country. Woman Jekka, everybody. Wah, wah. Woman Jekka means... Uh, to come with purpose. Uh, it also means welcome. So when I say woman Jekka, I mean you're coming with purpose here. I welcome you. Wawa means hello. So woman Jekka Wawa is woman Jekka, welcome, Wawa, hello. Nirinik Kasi Babakul Kuyap Warat Bujur Munbalam. So I'm introducing myself as Cassie. I'm a medicine and bush tucker woman and master weaver. I'm from Dadungara, Tangarong country, or should I say Dadungarang Bik, Tangarong Bik. Wawandri, Woiwarang, and I reside on Gurnai Kurnai Wak Wak, meaning Gunai Kurnai country. So I would like to pay my respects to past, present, and emerging um, peoples of the Kulin Nation. Now, today is a beautiful demonstration of my moon. Malam Marang, and that is my traditional culture, weaving techniques, processing, and my art practice. So what I've just done this morning for you is a beautiful little cleansing. Now, no, I know that we can't be face to face, but I'm actually sending you all beautiful healing energy through our Zoom today. So what I've actually burnt here is I've actually um, burnt some beautiful lemon scented gum with some beautiful fresh eucalyptus leaves as well. So having the two different types of leaves gives us a beautiful cleansing of ceremony. And also too, this is a practice that I start with before I actually start weaving these beautiful healing mats I do. 
So this cleanses my space. It cleanses my energy. It cleanses my aura. It cleanses my spirit. And when I actually um, do my cleansing, I like to sing as well. So I will normally sing dirt, dirt, darum, mara, mara. So I'll start going. Dun dun da da ma da ma da, dun dun da da ma da ma da, dun dun da da ma da ma da, dun dun da da ma da ma da. Mind, body, spirit, and soul. Mind, body, spirit, and soul. I invoke what I'm about to create with my body, my spirit, and my soul. Dun dun da da ma da ma da, dun dun da da ma da ma da, dun dun da da ma da ma da, dun dun da da ma da ma da. Balian banjoa, balian banjoa, dun dun da da ma da ma da, dun dun da da ma da ma da. Now that I've finished singing my song, to invoke and to empower my beautiful healing journey with these healing mats. It's a part of something that, that signifies who I am as an Aboriginal woman and to pass on knowledge of my ancestors. With my art practice, I love to use natural materials and work with a lot of different variety of mediums as well from country. I find it's really important for me to, um, to connect to my country and also to give an insight into my art practice it's not only sharing my ancestors' journey, but it's actually sharing who I am as an Aboriginal woman uh, to empower people with my artwork and my song and my ceremony um, gives me great, great um, satisfaction. And it also rewards me too when people commission these beautiful pieces. So I'm actually really um, would like to acknowledge that I have these beautiful pieces um, acquired by the Town Hall Gallery and I'm going to share with you a couple of my techniques. So these healing mats, as you can see behind me, I do have one huge healing mat behind me and that's actually made from pandanus. And I did, with those, did that weaving there behind me with traditional owners of country up the north. But what I've actually got here, which I'm gonna demonstrate with you today, is I've actually just started another healing mat. You can see here that it has beautiful weaved um, emu feathers bind with the lamandra. I love to work with lamandra, New Zealand flax. I also like to use kangaroo grass because it's significant to my people. Not only can, is it edible, you can eat it, but also um, it makes a beautiful fiber filler when I do the coil weave. I also like to use um, native river reeds. So the native common river reeds uh, I normally dry out and then process. Uh, the, the reason why we do process lamandra is because if we don't process it, it can actually shrink uh, quite a lot. And um, when you do weave with it fresh up um, and it shrinks, it can be a loose weave and we don't want that. So what we normally do is we would actually go out and we'd harvest the lamandra fresh and then strip it down into little pieces thin strips about this consistent and dry them out. I normally dry mine out for about a week, just depending though. Um, sometimes I can actually dry out for a couple of weeks, sometimes a couple of days. But I like to, um, to uh, gather the lamandra and just like my elders did many, many years ago, my ancestors, um, we actually chew the part, the the white base of it because it is actually carbohydrates but while you chew the the white part of the of the lamandra it, it actually um, is easier to strip down to get those beautiful consistent um, strips for your weaving now these are beautifully processed this one here is quite quite fresh and it's uh, been dried out for about three days now whereas this one here is dried out for about a week so they've got different endings. This is quite still quite pliable. This one's a little bit stiffer. And this is the one that I would prefer to use as my needle. This actually will be my filler. So when I do the coil technique, I normally hold a couple of um, strands of lamandra and then I tie 
tied the base of the lamandra with my needle that I have selected. And then once I've tied it, I actually bend it back into the fillers and then I start my coiling technique. Everyone is different with their techniques, but the baskets normally look the same. Now, being a left-handed weaver, I'm also a right-handed weaver as well, but I do prefer my left hand. So when I weave, I actually weave backwards. So for some, it can be a little bit confusing when I do teachings, and this is why I had to retrain myself to do it both ways. So what we normally do is with the, with the beautiful coil technique, um, I go around the back through the loop and then process it into some beautiful um, stitches. And it is a, it's called a blanket stitch. So these stitches then get weaved on to the, around the fillers to connect. So there's some beautiful little, there's some beautiful little stitch holes there. Now I've just done this previously. So when we do get to the stitch holes and we make enough, we actually put it into like a little horseshoe and manipulate the grasses and then continuing weaving around those fillers, we actually create like a snail shape. So we're going around and around and around and around. So basket weaving, has been something that's been passed down um, to me from many, many generations. My mother's um, non-Indigenous and she actually taught, um, or taught me, but she was actually taught by aunties and my grandmother. So then she could pass down the knowledge to me. So it would it be lost? My grandfather was a Tungurong elder and he was a fishnet maker. So I actually learned a lot of different techniques and I'm a holder, a master weaver of 11 of those techniques. I've traveled a lot of country and I've done a lot of cross country um, workshops and also been involved with women's weaving. And that has given me insight into other mobs um, from other countries. Uh, and their techniques as well. So I'm really privileged to, um, to be able to hold those weaves and to be able to teach them with respect and also seek the permission when I go on other people's country to be able to teach weaves. If there's someone else that does weaving on a part of country, I normally like to, um, to include them or actually put them first before myself. Um, but in saying that, we, um, we do get quite busy. So um, we normally just bounce off each other and, and facilitate these programs so we can share our knowledge and culture to people. So when I do start off, I continue and continue. Um, these healing mats, these healing mats do take time. I don't like to rush myself because I feel that if I do rush myself in creating, my art practice, um, it, it doesn't fulfill me. So. By, by sitting down beside a river, by, um, by underneath a tree, by the common reeds um, that, that are quite um, consistent along my property here. Um, I connect with country. I also find that I'm in my wild, wildlife. So I've got beautiful um, birds flying around above me. Uh, I do get a lot of feathers that drop, drop down that I collect. Um, the emu feathers especially, um, these are really, really special for me because I have a beautiful old emu and he's 58 years old and he was just recently on the ABC, believe it or not, and his name's PP. And when I go up to PP, he molts yearly um, and when he does his molting, uh, he leaves a lot of beautiful um, gifts for me, which I do gather. I do gather in my little weaved basket and then I come home and I process those. And after I process them, that's when I, I know straight away that, you know, I'm going to do a beautiful healing mat. I'll do my song. I'll do my cleansing. I'll have my beautiful processed emu feathers. I'll actually bind those emu feathers into the mat itself, okay, to give it some purpose because the emu burramal, the emu has um, beautiful, delicate feathers, nice and soft and nurturing, but the emu itself is quite strong and large and powerful and res resilient. So I like to look upon as Burramal being the, the um, safe passage to when I travel over country. So I've always got emu feathers um, in my pocket, in my car, with me all the time in my home. And again, by binding these beautiful, significant emu feathers into my work, 
it gives another element, uh, another, another part of spirit from country. So um, his story won't ever be lost because his story is weaved in this journey of the healing mat. Now, when I say healing mat, um, people go, oh, it's to be on the wall and hung as a healing piece. And, and for me, it's not that at all. I try and carry on the traditions um, of the significant meaning of the healing, healing floor mats. They are to be used on the floor. I, I have mine hanging up. But then when I want to do ceremony or I want to be able to teach the youth, the, the girls mainly, um, I like to pull these down and put them onto the beautiful country and sit on them. Um, I normally have about three or four of the mats. So then they can all sit on their own mat and it becomes a teaching, teaching tool, but it also um, becomes a nurturing uh, connection as well to our old people and, and their ways. And I think that's really important. You know, to be able to sit onto the healing mat and to be able to close your eyes and reflect on the old people's ways and, and acknowledge them. Um, you know, I say this, this, is, this is my signature, but it's actually, um, I'm copying my ancestors. So um, by carrying on this tradition, I'm reviving and keeping, keeping their ways alive. And that's really important for me to be able to do that. And I know that there's many out there that do the same as well. Um, so these mats can come in different sizes. Uh, my own mat that I have and that I take with me on country is five metres diameter. This one behind me is actually 2.5 metres diameter. So I've got one double that size. And actually, um, I've done a, a bit, bit of a wider strip so I can actually um, semi-roll it so it actually fits long, you know, ways in my car. And then I pull it out. It actually doesn't have any emu feathers on it because um, it, it's it's uh, kind of like it's important for me to show that you know you don't have to have the signature emu feathers on every single mat that I create, and it also represents um, a storytelling too. So when I pull out my large mat. I like to sit on them. I like to reflect. I like to have people come sit on it too. I love to tell the young ones stories um, and also to tell them a part of my journey and then nurture them as well in the processes of the lamandra, of the native grasses, um, how to care for country, but also to the processing of the emu feathers. Um, the process of the emu feathers is, is quite, quite demanding. And it does take a long time. And this is what people need to realise um, that, you know, these healing mats don't, aren't, you know, created overnight. Uh, I've used a couple of different techniques in these healing mats here, different stitches as well. But the processes, um, yeah, as I said, it is really demanding because not only do I have to um, forage uh, the emu feathers, uh, also, I have to clean and process them. So I know that I can get them online if I really wanted to, but I don't feel that would um, connect me in the way that, that this process does. So by going out and when Pete, Pete he, he molts, I go out and I collect and I collect all his feathers. Uh, sometimes in his partial little bear he's got on the riverbank, there's, there's a big mound of them, but they've got um, emu, emu poo in them. They've got mud. It's got, yeah, they're quite, some of them are quite, you know, yucky. So um, by gathering them up, coming back, I normally soak them in warm, lukewarm water and I leave them in the water for a couple of days until they all loosen up and then all the mud and, and the gunk get gets basically distributed into the water. Then I strain them, then I soak them again. And what I love to do is I love to put, um, I love to put lemon scented gum in with, in with the emu feathers and gently bring it to a boil. So I've got a big, big um, dish out the back and I put the emu, the emu feathers and the lemon scented gum, fresh lemon, lemon scented gum leaves into that water and I slowly bring it to a boil. And then as soon as I see it start boiling over, I let it, I let it simmer. And then I take it off, off the fire and I let it cool right down. And then with a stick, I'll just give it a good mix and straight away you can smell that beautiful lemon scented gum oil. And it also cleanses really well the, um, the emu feathers. So as you know, eucalyptus oil is antibacteria, antiviral. 
it is just so nurturing and that the smell is absolutely divine. So once I've done that, I, I then again, I strain it, I rinse them. Sometimes I'll do a couple of boil ups just to make sure that, that they're really clean and processed. Um, some people have said to me and suggested to put them in the washing machine and wash it through. I, I wouldn't do that, trust me. Um, you know, I had a friend that done that once and she ended up with emu feathers all through the machine and, and it's still, I think it broke, to be honest. But to keep it natural and, um, and in these ways is really important. So I try and do it naturally um, and organic and, and to keep this process going because as I said, you can't really put gum leaves into the washing machine. You need to be able to soak them and, and nurture these beautiful um, emu feathers with the beautiful eucalyptus as well. Um, there's also other um, processes that I do as well. Uh, with the tips of the emu feathers, uh, they do have still a bit of the oil from the emu um, that you can actually roll your, your thumb and finger around as well. And that actually, basically it gets quite sticky and it actually nurtures your, your fingers too. But when I've actually got my, my emu feathers and I finished processing and I'm ready to bind them to actually add to the um, emu healing mats, the um, sacred healing mats, I gather all the emu feathers together by the tips. Okay, like, like so. And I just give them a light little twist and I do normally sing as well when I do the twisting and I sing a, a little emu song. And then I process either some kangaroo sinew or what I've done here is I've got um, some stringy bark twine and it's actually been binded with wax. And that's another process in itself. So my art practice, um, it's, it's about um, belonging, identity, connection, uh, coming up with different solutions um, to natural ways rather than going to a shop and buying it. And that's what I find that, um, you know, uh, empowers me. So by going out and collecting bark from the trees and processing the bark with, um, with beeswax and doing a fine twisting technique of string making, uh, I actually come up with my own twine. And, and this can normally take about two to three months to actually make a ball of twine ready to process um, and bind these emu feathers. So the tips of the emu feathers, I bind around really softly, really slowly, try and keep it nice and consistent. And then I just tie off into a little knot. So I tie off into a little knot and like that and that's that's binding so binding up, down and then a little bit up uh, normally I, I can wax this with a little bit of beeswax um, I normally bind that the tips or otherwise I just leave it because what happens with my my wax string is that the wax will actually hold that all together and keep it nicely in place and it's quite sticky still. So I'm actually manipulating those tips. So then that will hold the emu feathers. And this is what I do for my, um, for my dancing as well. Um, when I make my emu feather skirts or adornment making. So my art practice takes me to different um, areas of creating. So now that I've got nice two, two nice little pieces of string coming up, um, normally with one bundle of emu feathers, I'll probably put about 30 into one bundle. So um, in the significant emu feather healing mats that you'll see, um, you know, either online or on my Instagram, you'll see that they're, that surrounds the mats. Um, there's probably normally about oh, 15,000 to 20,000 individually binded emu feathers um, into bundles. And, and then hand sewn onto the healing mat itself. So what I actually do is when, when I actually bind, I, I make my own needles out of bone, kangaroo shin bone. So again, to keep it nice and traditional and sacred and meaningful for me, I like to create the old ways, not the new. So by, by getting a shin bone, I um, grind down on my stone tools 
And then the little hole I punched with another bone. So I punch through and then with the sandpaper fig tree, the leaf is like sandpaper and I actually stick it in and I sand it back. And then again, with the bone sharpening, um, grinding stone tool, I'll, um, I'll grind away. And then what I do is I just thread, thread my, my string through. Okay, and then I weave, I'll just do it backwards here. I weave through, I hold it, I weave back down, and, and then I tie on, and this will become a part of the journey of the weave mats. So every single stitch hole, there's probably, as I said, there's probably about oh, 15, 20,000. It, it, you know, it, it can be amazing, you know, when you really do count up how many stitch holes around the ends. But um, yeah, the, the emu feathers will get sewn into each individual hole. Sometimes I skip holes in case, um, you know, there's too many feathers. I don't want them to bunch up too much, but I go around the edges and I sew, hand sew um, the beautiful emu feathers onto the backs of these mats. And then what I do is once I have actually completed all the feathers around and I'm really happy with that, with the outcome of the mat and I'm really happy with the bunches of the emu feathers that have, have surrounded the mat, I do a beautiful sacred ceremony. And as you can see here, I've got my handmade twine with, with my um, the, un, the, the down uh, baby uh, galah feathers here. And I have a white mark and then I have a beautiful ochre yellow as well. And this is what I like to do. I like to paint up, I like to wear my headpiece and then I like to sing in ceremony. So once these mats have basically, they're, they're completed, I get beautiful white ochre and with my bone tools, I grind the ochre and I sprinkle it into my hand and then I dust it over the mat and then I smoke it in ceremony. So I'll take it outside, I'll dust it with white ochre, I'll smoke it in ceremony, meaning I'll sing a beautiful empowering spiritual song and I'll smoke it all. And then I dust, I dust that white ochre again with the lemon scented gum leaves for cleansing and prosperity and health. And I'll actually go around with all the emu feathers that have been binded on the emu healing mat and give them a, a beautiful cleansing as well before they go to the new owner or to the, or the place where it's going to be um, acquired. So the healing map is um, yeah something that, that I hold very, very um, dear to me. And I like to pass on the significant knowledge to the young, the young girls, especially. And during these times of COVID as well, it's, um, it's very important to share, share that nurturing and that healing and the energy and the passion, what goes into these beautiful mats. You can see here too, this is, um, you know, this is not complete yet. This is just a demonstration one today, um, but this one will probably be about 2.5 meters diameter. So I've still got a, a long way to go. At the moment, it's um, one meter. And so I'll continue this journey and I'll keep creating and going around using the beautiful coil technique. So it's a simple blanket stitch coiling around the beautiful um, fillers. I will be binding more emu feathers. So how I bind the emu feathers into this is um, I'll get, the, get some feathers. This isn't just a little example here, a bit of a demonstration. I'll click the feathers. It doesn't matter whether they're back or, you know, I don't have to worry about them too much if they're, they're a little bit shabby at the start because what they will do then is they will actually bind in. I'll wrap them around and bind them into, into the grasses here, okay? And you'll actually get little pieces that will come and stick out. Then I'll get, I'll get my lamandra my lamandra here and I'll continue weaving over the top so going through that stitch hole so there's no needles we don't need to use any needles because 
the, the tip is actually a needle. We get the scissors to make it a little bit sharper, sharper there. And going round the back through the loop, left to right, and pull it up and not so tight. So weaving. Now with the lamandra, when when I actually um, dry it out and process them, I do have to soak soak the grasses in warm water, just so then they're they're easy to work with again. So weaving. So I'm just basically doing a nice little simple um, one stitch. So one stitch in each, each little hole here, the stitch holes here. But if I wanna make it really tight, I will actually go into that hole three or four times. So it just depends, but you can see how this is short now, I've got to put a new needle through. So that's where we always have to have Lamandra ready to go again. So over the top of the old one, pulling it through, the ends, the end and the new go back into the fillers and around I go again to connect a new beautiful needle. And this is just gorgeous. This is working so beautiful. So I love working with Lamandra the most because um, it, it just connects with me with, you know, my ancestors, old peoples. Um, it reminds me of my grandmother. My grandmother used to always have Lamandra hanging up in the house and I still carry this forward today. And it's um, oh, it's just it's just a beautiful nurturing plant. I, I just love I love growing it. Uh, I love harvesting, and I just love processing the, the flower heads to to actually make flour too, because people just don't realise that lamandra has many many um, uses, and you've got to utilise them, you know, to to eat, to make, to create. It's just beautiful. So, the demonstration here today is I'm using Lamandra and Emu Feathers. So you can see there how the Emu Feathers will stick out a little bit. So I'll probably do a beautiful run, a beautiful row around and continue um, weaving those beautiful Emu Feathers. So there'll be, a, um, it'll go from Emu Feathers in the centre to plain and then Emu Feathers for a few rows and then it'll be go plain and maybe a few more Emu Feathers, you know, and then plain and then all the emu feathers surrounding that. So that's a little demonstration of the emu feathers. There's also two um, on my healing mats is um, the beautiful uh, feather flowers. And years ago on the missions, uh, um, the women, if there was no flowers in the valleys, they'd actually go and find some beautiful um, bird feathers and they'd sit around and they would actually create flowers. Now, the feather flowers for me personally signifies um, another part of healing. It, it's, it, it's a healing of connection and belonging and identity. And I, I feel that, um, you know, when I create these, it's, um, it, it's a part of um, not only celebration, but mourning as well. So when, when we have sorry business and, and someone passes away, um, I always make a beautiful little bunch of, um, of feather flowers to give to, you know, say if my uncle passed on, I will make some for my aunt. It, it's just something that, that I've always done. And even as a little girl, I, I collect feathers and, and I bunch them up into a little bundle and I bind them and, you know, I put them behind my ear, I wear them in my hair, um, I even make necklaces. It's just something that's, you know, I, I've really nurtured um, for many, many years. And even in my ceremonies and when I do my dancing, um, you know, again, I'll, I'll collect and I'll gather um, in my creative art practice natural, you know, palms and I'll get the fibres and, and bones and again have the, the feathers of the native birds um, hanging down as a sign of protection and nurturing and, and safe passage too. And as I said, everyone has their own story. Um, you're going to come across other Aboriginal female artists that will use feathers in, in different ways and, and their story will be similar, but everyone's got their own personal journey and connection and belonging with them, I think. And it's even like with the river reeds and, and other, other adornments I make, um, you know, I, I use possum, possum fur, 
uh, I use snake bones, uh, waxes and seeds and echidna quills and you know every animal um, has a significant story to it and to be able to connect with that and to create and include that in my art practice gives me um, yeah it gives me that spiritual connection to why and how and before colonization um, yeah it, it just you know yeah just whether it's gift making or or dance or ceremony or or a story so it gives me that that insight into their lives as well and my father's always said to me too you know to be able to um to be able to teach and talk about it you have to experience it so you know i've always been been encouraged to go out on country to to collect um to embrace all the organic materials and to bring them home and 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 just play around with but but listening to to the spirit you know who guides me every day um you know whether it's right or wrong you know I'll, I'll find some things and and sometimes I won't take from it I'll, I'll just bury it and, and do a beautiful healing ceremony because I know I've got a feeling that I shouldn't shouldn't touch that animal or or bird um sometimes I I find things you know on my walks and hikes and and I'll just get this all of a sudden this empowering feeling that I need to collect that I, I can take that so I, I take what I need I'm never I'm never a greedy person I only take what I need and to, to create with because if I took too much I'd have to create with it you know and and or otherwise we'll just sit in another tub so um yeah it, it is it's um yeah sixty five thousand years of culture definitely and um I'm just reading a beautiful little chat here it's um it is. It's so. It's so important to um, you know to learn about this and and you know hear from other artists as well and 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 nurture. And at the moment, we're actually going to go to back to Rachel because she's going to show you a little bit of a slideshow, and then I'll come back and I'll talk about my next journey and my next path.
Oh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much for sharing that. So um, as you could see that, you know, I love working with organic natural materials and uh, that was just a little insight into my life. And I'm really excited that um, I have some participants here today that, um, you know, I love and I adore and, and we weave and it, it's just, yeah, it, it's just beautiful to see some, um, some little comments that they, they know that I've got, just got this beautiful native budgie um beaky mr beaky and i've actually taught him how to weave so with my journey i i do unfortunately overdo it at times and um and i actually got this little budgie it's a long story but i got this beautiful little budgie and i was actually going through some trouble with my tendonitis and and micro tears in my arm that couldn't actually see me me continue my weaving journey and so i actually taught him how to um how to weave and he actually so when I when I put the thread um, through he'll actually get the end and he'll pull it and sometimes run up, run up to my shoulder and pull it nice and tight so then I just push through he'll grab it and he'll pull it up nice and tight so I do have to acknowledge Mr Beaky my beautiful little parakeet budgie um, into my artworks as well so uh, this year I've entered a beautiful piece at the Koori Heritage Trust Koori Art Show and I have to acknowledge that Mr Beaky did help with that so thank you so much um, Rachel for actually capturing my beautiful budgie because without him um, I would have been a little bit lost in this journey so he's, he is gorgeous and he is learning skills too every day so um, he can't actually do the, the, the twisting yet but um, I'm sure that we'll get there somewhere but I find him that he's actually taking some of um, some of my strings into his um, cage and he plays around with them so anyway, on my next part of my, um, on my journey uh, with the town gallery, uh, I got commissioned to do some beautiful midden pots. Now these midden pots are really, really, again, a sacred story. It's a part of history. If you don't know what a shell midden is, if you do go along the, the, coastal, um, the coastal parks, uh, you'll find that uh, in areas there'll be uh, scattered, scattered pieces of shells um, you could walk upon them uh, that, that are quite old and that's classed as a midden. When, when we do archaeology and we um, cut into an, or do um, excavation works along the coastal lines, you'll actually see some um, parts taken out and you'll see shells and bones and then some sands and clays and then you'll see more shells and bones and clays and, and it, it basically builds up. And this is called a midden. And the midden actually is like a timeline. It's a timeline of history. And when I was out on this um, ranger program, I was doing a little bit of archaeology um, with some rangers, and we we all went out on country. And I, I just I just looked and I saw this beautiful midden. And I said to the park ranger, I said, oh, "Wow, how come you haven't got this, you know, fenced off? Because this is amazing." And he had no idea that it was actually so significant to his people and the area that he actually went, "Okay, this is um." this is going to be um you know marked and and you know recorded and registered and and it actually gave me an idea because i thought no one really understands or or how many people do know about these beautiful um you know shell middens so i decided to create some pots so a few years ago i I've always mucked around with clays and I normally hop in my kayak and I'll go down to the Avon River at the back of my property here and there's a beautiful pipe clay and I'll actually gather all the pipe clay and I'll put it into the top of my, my kayak and I'll kayak home, jump out. When I get home, I normally put it in plastic bags to keep it nice and, and you know, mushy and, and so it doesn't dry out because it, it can dry out quite quickly in the sun. But normally what I do is I get the pipe clay and I'll actually put ochre and sand and emu fat as well. And I'll, I'll mush it all up. Sometimes I put charcoal in too, just to give it that really nice texture. And I'll start creating beautiful little bowls. Now, um, ceramics has always been something that I, I've dabbled in, but um, I, I want to do it traditionally. So by, by getting this pipe clay and moulding it, 
I then light a fire, I dig a beautiful little trench, I put the hot coals in that little trench like an earth oven, and then I put a few pieces of um, wet paper bark around the edges, so it like it smoulders. And then with that raw piece of clay bowl that I've just created, I put it in and I heat it up. So it starts heating up and it's like it's it's firing, you know, traditionally. I'll actually put ashes and, and hot, hot ashes over the top and also inside as well. Once it's, once it's been left there for about an hour and a half, I actually push all the ash away, I clean it, and then I use a little brush and I, I brush it off. Sometimes it will be still a little bit soft on the outsides. So then what I do is I collect shells and I crush them up to, um, to basically represent the beautiful um, shell middens. And I'll line them and I'll continue doing it around and around. This one here is a little example. So you can see here how I've, I've molded my, my pipe clay. I've, I've heated it up. I've got some beautiful shells here and I've embedded them to represent the shell middens. And there's also some bone fragments as well of the kangaroo. So normally when I do go and find bones, I normally find roadkill on the side of the road. And if it's decomposed enough that it's got beautiful sun bleached um, clean bones, I'll take them home and I'll respectfully crush them up and I will also to add them into the beautiful pipe clay while it's still soft. Once it's, once it's all been embedded with the beautiful shells, um, I'll actually sit it out into the sun and let, let the rest air dry. So once it's completely air dry, um, then I seal it. I seal it with emu fat and wattle sap. So it, it all kind of like sticks and molds and I know it's not going anywhere. This is a lid. This is a lid and it's got two dear little shells on the top of this lid, but you can see the charcoal pieces representing fire. Um, you can see sands and there's also little, little pieces of ochre as well in that too. So I'm, I, I don't like to have everything perfect. I like to be able to shape, you know, with my hands. I don't want to use, you know, cutters or, or you know, or um, sculptural ceramic tools to, to create these. I want to make sure that it's got my imprint in it because it's my passion to be able to tell a story. It's my passion that I, I, I continue this, you know, journey and share my culture with so many people. Um, and, you know, to be able to just, you know, as I said, be able to have my my fingerprint in there. You know, it, it's like my signature. I don't have to sign anything. It's my signature. And this is what's so important. And especially when I, um, you know, get get with children and, um, and adults alike, you know, and to share these stories in creating beautiful little pots, you know, and it might look to some people like a, a four-year-old's done it, but you know, for me, this this is this is my histories. You know, this is this is my family connection. This is my belonging right here in this beautiful little pot, and this is one of the little pots that is going to town hall. Now, as I said, little things flake off here and there, but it's meant to be. If it doesn't stay on, it's not meant to be. But it's going to tell a story, and when people look at it, they'll see all these different little, you know, pieces, different parts. You know. Because many years ago, we didn't have, you know, um, or before colonisation, we didn't have, you know, landfills and tips and all this, you know, rubbish and stuff. You know, all we had was country. And, and if people can kind of um, take that upon themselves, like, you know, you know, the recycling aspect and, and nurturing country and not littering and, and keeping country clean, you know, um, yeah, we would have a better environment and, and it would help our climate and everything. So they, these do tell a story about climate change as well. And the, the latest pot that I'm actually creating too in my art practice, um, it's another element I'm adding is I've got, it's basically past, present and future. So I have a beautiful big, big high clay pot at the moment it's setting and it's got the beautiful shell middens to represent our past before colonization, how we lived, how we treated country how we gathered around as a family and shared and, and you know and built on our knowledge and then and then the second part it's got um you know the present it's got plastics and metals and glasses and everything to represent that colonization so we've got the uh, the um the past with aboriginal um peoples only then colonization with all the glass and the plastics wrapped around and then the top is left bare 
and why it's left there is because who knows what our future is going to hold you know what what um what elements are going to be added to that i don't know but i'm going to leave that there and that's going to tell another significant story of you know how are we going to be looking after our future our future generations especially you know um where are we going to be going with with um our world and um you know it's it is all about healing too so you know, that's going to be another significant um, pot that I do create. And look, I might even donate that to somewhere that, you know, can tell that story and empowerment of, of that pot. But these midden pots are something very, very special to me. And, and I'm very, very honoured that um, with the NASIA, the Telstra Art Awards, uh, two years running, I've actually um, entered my, my beautiful pots and they tell a story. And the first pot I entered was last year um, at the awards was, was the Shell Midden pot. And the beautiful story and what people love to see um, was with my artist talk, it actually had my beautiful little grandson's um, fingerprint in it because I left it alone to dry out and he came and he's very, very inquisitive like his grandmother and, um, and he loves to be on country and explore and feel the elements as well. So he went out and he saw that I created this beautiful pot and he was so intrigued by it that he actually picked up the lid and his fingerprint, um, because it wasn't um, fully dry, his, his little fingerprint was marked in the lid. And when I was at the um, at Darwin last year and I told the story and people go, oh, why did you smudge it out? Why should I smudge it out? It's a connection to storytelling. I'm passing on this knowledge to my grandson. He's understanding his culture. He's learning his ways. This is so important. And why would I smudge out his fingerprint? Because it's his culture too, and it's his story and his belonging, his identity. So that's why I kept it there. This year, I've done a beautiful um, ochre mud clay pot with stringy bark and, and earth elements and beautiful wedge-tailed eagle feathers like this, okay? Because I took him out on country. We went up, we looked at Big Bundle's nest and down came, lo and behold, down came two feathers and they landed in the ground. And that's when I story told him, I told him our creation story. The Kulin Nation men were made out of bark from the stringy bark tree. The women were made out of mud, mother earth, okay? Um, Bunjil was our ancestor creator. He came down in a meteorite, landed, it landed on earth, bam, out he came, okay? And that's when he made the valleys, rivers, just like the rainbow serpent from another time, another, another part of community, another part of country did. Bunjil for our Kulin people did all that, mountains, valleys, rivers, animals, people. So Bunjil, our, our creator, when we found these beautiful feathers, I said to Flynn straight away, we have to take them back and where are we going to put them? And as soon as he saw that big pot that had no feathers, he said, Cas, cas, we need to put them in the pot because that's the Bunjil's ancestor creation story. So we put them in the pot and that, that got in this year and that's telling another part of story. So, you know, using natural elements in my art practice, um, I'd, I'd never change it. And I always say to people and, you know, um, and, you know, educators as well, being out in nature, you know, cleanses your spirit, cleanses your soul, cleanses your mind, your body, your spirit. You know, it, it's just beautiful. And, you know, it's NADOC week and I want you to be able to go out. I want you to be able to, you know, uh, feel the, the, the sun, you know, hit your, hit your skin and, and, you know, smell the fresh air, you know, grab some gum leaves and scrunch them up and inhale, take your shoes and socks off and be grounded. You know, find some beautiful, um, you know, resources out there. Come back and create if you wish. You know, it, it's all about nurturing your your inner spirit and um, and keeping, for me, it's keeping culture alive, but also for non-Indigenous people to be able to connect and respect and acknowledge too. And in saying that, um, a glass of water, a glass of water, a gum leaf. I did a smoking earlier, but you can do this at home today a gum leaf, your glass of water, dip the gum leaf in water, okay, and, and lick it. Because what you're doing is you're telling on your, on your country that you're on, that you're living upon, you're telling Bunjil that you respect his law, L-O-R-E, that you are going to nurture the book books, the babies, the children. 
you are going to respect country, you're going to acknowledge that the traditional owners, uh, you're going to take it upon yourself to, you know, be, be connected and grounded as well. It, this means safe passage for you. So whenever I travel over to countries, um, Gunai Kurnai country, um, Tongarong country, Wurundjeri country, Wunwarang country, uh, Gumaroi country, uh, I always take a gum leaf with me and water and dip it, lick it, because it's not only leaving the bad behind or the negativity, it cleanses me, but it also gives me the, um, the go ahead, the safe passage to go on that country and, and showing and respecting spirit that I am here in um, good intention and I'm going to respect Bunjil's law. So that's something you could do today. So I think it's really important that everyone celebrates NAIDOC week. And um, I really th like to thank, um, before we do go to our question time, um, definitely thank Rachel and uh, the, the team at Town Hall Gallery and also to uh, for inviting me to be able to, to speak freely and to speak um, passionately about you know, my, my cultural and um, creative art practice. I've got so much I could talk about, but such limited time, unfortunately. And also to, to the participants who've taken, taken time out to come and join, you know, us today and, and especially me and listening to me. Um, from my heart to yours, I, I would like to say nanagujin. So meaning thank you. Thank you so much for um, having that respect and to be able to acknowledge. So um, we're going to go now to um, some questions and I, hopefully I can answer them straight up. So if you do have questions, please send them through because I am here to answer anything. Thank you so much. That was a really incredible session with so many um, just rich, particularly uh, insightful messages that we need to take away about you know, protecting our, our environment and respecting um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and history. Yeah, just thank you on behalf of the whole group. Um, yeah, I hope you could read these um, some really special messages um, from some of the guests. So I'll just read out. Um, Excuse me if I'm not pronouncing this properly, but uh, Robin has asked, uh, can you use xanth xanthoria leaf grass tree for weaving? Yes, yes you can. Yes, so that that's actually, so our grass tree, um, yeah, so our, our grass tree, basically any native plant fibers you can experiment with. You can, um, you know, respectfully, you, you've got to remember, I, I would prefer, if you're, you're going into weaving, I would prefer you to um, grow your own, nurture your own so you get that beautiful connection. If you know a place where native grasses are growing and, and it doesn't belong to you, always seek permission to, to cut and to gather. Um, you've also got to remember like parks and, and um, you know, protected places, you know, it, it, it's illegal to do that. So always be, be mindful of that. But, you know, if you've got friends that, you know, are growing it in their gardens, um, you know, or, um, you know, you, you know, areas that that haven't got that protection on it, um, but, you know, say, you know, there could be um, a, a group of a bush kinder or something that, that grows it and you'd like to nurture, you know, and, and collect some grasses, um, always, always knock on the door and ask permission. I do it all the time. I've got a list of people that, that, you know, even they ring me up and say, hey, Cass, um, you know, this is really getting out of hand. Can you come and cut it back? And I've got a kinder in Mafra, Queen Street Kinder. Um, they call me up and say, oh, the lamandra is just getting so big and out of control and it's um, starting to prickle prickle the kids. So I'll go in there because I've got that permission and, and, I'll, um, and I'll collect and then I'll sit down and I'll talk, talk to the children, engage with the children while I'm there and tell them why I'm collecting it, what I'm going to be making so they get a better understanding and they, they know a bit about the plant as well. So, um, yeah, tr try and experiment with lots of different elements if you can. Um, you know, you can use she oak leaves. They're, oh, they're, they're beautiful. Uh, you know, you've got the pine leaves as well. You've got dinellas. You've got, um, oh, yeah, oh, the list goes on. Lamandra. There's different species of lamandra, so you can go for it much as you like. But you've got to remember, too, there is processes as well that some grasses will need. There's also two, um, uh, the New Zealand flax. And I really do, even though it's not, um, you know, native to Australia, 
it's still a connection because the New Zealand uh, Maori and uh, Maori mobs are, uh, you know, we, we're like brothers and sisters. And so, you know, that that inter introduction of the um, New Zealand flax for me, it, it's um, it's native and it's beautiful to work with. And I really enjoy working with um, New Zealand flax. So that's another one that you can actually basically use straight up and, and it doesn't have that shrinkage like Lamandra. So I, I do like to work with that. And especially for beginners to actually put them into, um, yeah, put them onto the, the um, flax first. But I've got some beautiful connections with the Peppermanati women. Um, up north and connections that I get sent sand palm um, leaves and I've got taught the technique of how to split them as, and strip them and also pandanus. So um, it's been, yeah, I've, I've had some beautiful cross-cultural um, programs that have allowed me to, to keep these um, beautiful natural grasses and have that, you know, connection to swap over knowledge as well. Thanks, Cassie. Um, there are a couple of other questions, but I realise it's just gone midday. So I might um, ask those people that uh, sent those questions through uh, to email them to townhallgallery at burundara.vic.gov.au. I'll put the email in the chat um, and we'll, we'll continue this conversation beyond the session. Um, so again, Cassie, just want to thank you for such an incredible session. Um, we're really, really lucky to have had you part of um, the City of Burundara NAIDOC Week celebrations this week. So thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our wonderful guests who I think have just been blown away by this session. So thank you all for attending. Um, yeah, as I said, any further questions, please email them through to the Town Hall Gallery email address. Um, and we'll be also sending a follow-up email that includes a link to this recording. Um, and we'd also love you to respond to a survey um, for some feedback about your experience. Um, and also for more information about Town Hall Gallery and Burundara Arts online events and activities, please visit www.burundara.vic.gov.au slash arts. Take care, everybody. Thanks again, Cassie, and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.